Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Glad you could join us. Um, we're coming to the end, what's been a most interesting study on Paul and friends. And so over the next probably three weeks, we should be able to wrap it up, and then we'll start a new, whole new study, and I'm going to tell you more about it in the weeks to come on what we're going to do starting in July. But I thought to get started, we'd kind of use the map to kind of review um, what's happened. So uh, Paul has been on two previous missionary journeys. Um, he's taken different people with him. So he's had Barnabas, and then he had Silas. Timothy has accompanied him. Titus, for a lot of the trips, has accompanied him, and particularly the second and the third missionary trip. Luke has been a traveling companion, and there's a whole list of others that we don't even know about. We just know that there was groups that traveled with him at various stages on his trips. He decides at the age of 60 to start out on his third uh, missionary trip. We call say that he had four missionary trips, but in reality, he only had three. The fourth one was he was a prisoner and he's taken to Rome. We call that the fourth trip. Really, uh, it's not a missionary trip in a traditional sense of the word. And so last week, we looked at some of the key things that happened on this trip. So he goes back and he starts in Antioch up here north of Syria. He goes back home, visits probably family, and then he stops off in Lystra, where Timothy was from. Probably he's visited with um, his family there. And then he spent, goes over to Ephesus, which is there on the coast uh, on the west of, of a in West Asia on the uh, Aegean Sea. He spends over two years there in Ephesus. There he stays with Priscilla and Aquila while he's preaching there. How did he get his livelihood? Because he was there for a length of period of time, he would basically start up his tent making, you, working with leather, and this provided him income um, for not only him, but for those that were traveling with him. After about two plus years in Ephesus, he then takes a large entourage, probably could have been as many as a dozen to 20 people on the trip that takes him up to Troas. And then he makes his way into Europe to Philippi, then to Thessalonica, then to Berea, then to Athens, and then to Corinth. His primary purpose on this trip was to collect the funds to help the Jerusalem church. As we've said before, Paul did this on several occasions, and this is one. And the purpose for the large contingency of people was he wanted nothing to do with that money. He didn't want to be accused of anything, and so he brought along this large contingency that basically would carry the money. Now, someone asked me the other time, how did he carry the money when he's doing all this walking? Well, more than likely, he had a donkey or a mule that they would put their supplies on, whatever they had that, that would carry, because most of the times mules were not used to write on. They were used to carry uh, materials and uh, product. Uh, and so more than likely, they, they were able to carry the, the offering. Um, last week, we looked at the long-winded preacher Paul was. Paul started out, he was preaching one evening, preached for a few hours, and a guy falls asleep, falls out of the third floor window, kills himself. Then Paul goes down, prays over him, heals him. He goes back up, and they have communion and dinner, and then he preaches for the rest of the night till morning. That must have been some exciting evening that they had there. So we finish the trip. He, after he goes back and says his goodbyes to Ephesus now, because he's never going to see them again, he heads over to Tyre and, wa and, and walks down to Jerusalem. And that's where we're going to pick up our story today. Now, while he's making that journey from Ephesus, when he said goodbye to everyone, he starts to receive warning from people who were led of the Lord to, to let him know it's not going to end well for you, Paul. But Paul he was determined, and he said, I know that my days are numbered. I'm in my 60s now. I don't know how much longer I'm going to live. I want to get down to Jerusalem. So, and this is where we're going to pick up the story for today. When we, who's we? That's Luke writing, so he's including himself. So when Paul and his entourage, Luke being part of it, when we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. 
The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James and all the elders who were present. Notice he does not include any of the disciples. By this time, now we're in the late 50s, more than likely the disciples have left to go and scatter to share the good news. Tradition tells us, the Bible doesn't, but tradition tells us that some went down into North Africa, others went up into Greece and into Turkey and Armenia, kind of like in the southern Russia border. Thomas might have gone all the way over to India, because this is more than likely where he was killed, was in India. So all that's left of the leadership of the church is James, the brother of Jesus, and the elders. Okay, so let's move on. So Paul greets them. So he greets James, the pastor of the Jerusalem church, and the elders, and he reports in detail what God has done among the Gentiles. Again, the Jerusalem church is by and large a Jewish church of believers, and so, but they're fascinated with Paul's ministry, and they hear about what he's done among the Gentiles, and when they heard this, they praise God. So we see that wall that's been broken down, that separated uh, the Jew from the Gentile, the free from the slave, all of that that's taking place. Then they, who's they? These would be the elders of the Jerusalem church, said to Paul, they got a, a problem. What's the problem, Paul? You see, brother Paul, brother Paul, how many thousands of Jews have believed? Now, they weren't in Paul's ministry so much as the disciples and those in the greater Jerusalem area. So thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law, which meant that they were good Jewish practicing, adhering to the law, doing the temple worship and all those things, but yet they had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And word has reached us, or reached them, and they have been informed that you teach, Paul, that all the Jews who live among the Gentiles, again, this would not be the ones in the Jerusalem area, but these would be the ones that were scattered up in Antioch and Ephesus and Corinth and all those places. We've received word. We've heard this, you know, how rumors get going, right? that you're teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, to totally reject the, the law and the traditions and, and you know, Sabbath and all those other things, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs, so kosher diets and all those things. What shall we do, Brother Paul? We've got a problem. Because it's connected because to it, the TV. So if you're going to be here among us, be aware of the fact that there's a lot of people that are, aren't really happy with you, Paul, because they hear what you have done. Now, we're not going to take time to go over, but they resolved the issue. Uh, the issue was there were four, probably people, the Gentiles, who had converted to Judaism and were now had become Christ believers, and they were going through all the rituals to become Jewish. And so they asked Paul to become part of the process by paying some of the fees that they would be required to pay at the temple in order to perform the Jewish sacrifices and, and the traditions there. He doesn't do exactly what they ask, but he, he actually pays for them. He doesn't go and participate with them, but he does pay for them to do so. And that seems to calm everyone down, that that Paul's not as radical as we have heard, okay? So the issue is resolved, but seven days later, another issue pops up, and this is when it gets really fun for Paul. So seven days later, some Jews who had come down from the province of Asia. Now, if you remember the map, this is kind of memory time to see how sharp we were when I showed you the map. Where is Asia? Well. Asia Minor, or it's modern Turkey. So these people had come down from the place that Paul had grown up, was from where Paul had been on his first and second, and even his third missionary journeys. And so they had come down from the province of Asia, and they saw Paul in the temple, and they recognized him. 
again, they must have connected. We don't know, have no history here, what the connection was, but they recognized Paul. And here's what happened. They stir up the whole crowd shouting, fellow Israelites, help us grab this man. This is the one who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our people being the Jews, and our law and this place. What place? Trivia question. What place was he referring to? Where are they at? They're in the temple. So he preaches against the temple. He preaches against our law. Okay? And furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. And then Luke kind of explains what they're talking about. They had previously seen a Greek by the name of Trophimus, who was from Ephesus, in the city with Paul. And they assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So you know how rumors start. They see Paul. He's hanging out with some Greeks. He's walking the city. All of a sudden, Paul shows up in the temple, and they assume that Paul has brought his Greek friends into the temple to defile it. Of course, we are never guilty of jumping to those drastic conclusions when we kind of put two and two together and come up with six or whatever the number is. So this is what happened. So <laughs> bless Paul everywhere he goes. He gets all kinds of problems. So he arrives in Jerusalem thinking, oh, great, I can tell about God's grace and how he's helped the Gentiles. He's got to deal with one issue. Now he's dealing with pretty much a mob on his hands. So here's the rest of the story. The whole city by that time was up in arms, and the people came running from all directions. They seized Paul, and they drag him from the temple. And while they were trying to kill him, <laughs> News reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Remember, Rome only cares about two things, and two things alone. Pay your taxes and keep the peace. Well, we're not dealing with taxes here. We're dealing with peace. So he hears, reaches him, probably one of the soldiers was out kind of walking the temple area. He runs back to where the commander is, says, hey, commander, we got a problem on our hands. The whole city's in an uproar. They're in the Temple Mount area, and they're about ready to kill somebody. So verse 32, he, referring to the commander, at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. And when the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. That's great, Paul. I'm sure loved that. The commander then arrests Paul. He's getting beaten, and he's going to get arrested because he's thinking, I can't arrest all these people, but I can arrest the person they're trying to beat and get him out of here. So he's actually probably being pretty strategic here. So he arrests Paul. He orders him put in chains, which had to subside or bring the crowd pitch down a little bit. And then he asks, who? He was. Who are you that created such a commotion here? And what have you done? Some in the crowd decide to answer for Paul. You have never seen that happen where someone asks you a question and somebody else answers for you? Never happens, right? So some in the crowd start answering for Paul. And they, one shouts one thing and someone else shouts another thing. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. So he's going to be removed from the Temple Mount and taken to where the Roman soldiers stay. But when Paul reaches the steps, and I'm going to show you a map here of what, what this looks like. So when Paul reaches the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be, and I'm sorry, it's cut off there, and they kept shouting, get rid of him, get rid of him. Well, let's pause there and look at what the barracks were. So here's the Temple Mount. In the, right in the middle of the Temple Mount, that comes up here. I won't show up on the screen. Of course, is the temple itself. The area outside that kind of that rectangle there in the middle, that's where the Gentiles could be. You just could not be in that inner court there. All right? Um, and the barracks are up there in the northeast corner, if you're... if we're facing north here. 
it, that's Antonia Fortress. And that's where about 500 soldiers were stationed that kind of took care of Jerusalem. Um, again, as we said before, the Roman officials did not live in Jerusalem. <laughs> they wanted to get far away from Jerusalem as possible. But because there were so many religious holidays and they had to keep the peace, um, they kept this contingency of 500 soldiers in that fortress. That's where they're taking. Now, you say, what steps are we referring to? Well, there were actually five entrances that you could get into the Temple Mount. You see here, down here, the Shoshin Gate. That's the eastern gate. If you went to Jerusalem today, that gate is closed. And the reason why it's closed is that during the Ottoman Turks, they were fearful because they knew the scripture that says that the Messiah would come through the eastern gate. And so what they have done is they have scaled that up and they, they put a little graveyard in, in kind of in front of it. So at this point, that is sealed off. But there was another gate that went out the northern portico, and that would head to the fortress or to the barracks. Then there were actually two gates that were the main gates down on, we'll call it the southern. You see they're called covered stairways. You actually went down some steps underneath those rooms, and there was a pretty high elevation. The Temple Mount is probably at least 100 feet above the topography of the city itself. And so there were some massive stair structures that were created because um, Solomon, when he established the Temple Mount, basically had flattened off a little hill so that it was flat. And he brought in massive, massive um, stone structures to build the foundation. If you ever see a picture of the Western Wall, it's not the wall of the temple you're looking at. You're looking at the wall that Solomon built as the foundation for the Temple Mount, and the stones are massive, massive, massive stones. So what's happening is, is Ta, Paul excuse me, is being ushered to the Antonio Fortress or to the barracks, and it's, he's getting ready to leave that open area when the crowd goes ballistic and says, kill him, kill him, kill him. And now we're going to pick up the story because Paul takes every opportunity he can to speak. <laughs> and so he does again. So as the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something? <laughs> the commander should have been smart and said no, but he didn't. Okay. His first question is, do you speak Greek? Now, why is this important? Because this is an area that if you're from the, the local, you spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. But again, because Jerusalem is kind of a center for all Jews, many of the Jews who came spoke Greek. Furthermore, he thinks he's an outsider because he's not from the area here. So he asked him, do you speak Greek? And then he goes on and really insults him. Aren't you an Egyptian? who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out in the wilderness some time ago. So he thinks he's kind of like a zealot who's constantly fighting the Romans, kind of like little gorilla, you know, and attacking them. And so he, he's asking him, are you Greek or are you that Egyptian? And Paul's answer says, no, I'm a Jew. I'm not from Jerusalem. I'm from Tarsus and Cilicia. That's Asia, minor. And by the way, I'm also a citizen of no ordinary city. Well, there were lots of cities in the Old Roman Empire, but there were some that were special because of their large population of Roman soldiers and everything else. And they tend to have importance within the empire. And so what Paul is saying is, I'm from Tarshish, but it's not just any ordinary city. It's a special city to the Roman Empire. You should care about this, commander. So two things. I'm from Tarsus, and I'm a Roman citizen. Can I now speak to the people? And at this point, you got to imagine the, the commander is having all kinds of thoughts because I've got a Roman citizen who's Jew who's about ready to have a mob kill him. What, how do I resolve? How do I get myself out of this situation. So after receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps 
that were going to lead off the Temple Mount. He stands on the steps, and he motions to the crowd. And when they heard him speak in Aramaic, there was a holy hush. They quieted because he's speaking their local dialect. It would be like someone from New Jersey going down to uh, southern Alabama and all of a sudden speaking with the, the, the southern dialect. And all of a sudden, ooh, this is interesting. He's not from here, but he can speak like us. This is pretty interesting. So they're quiet. They're going to hear what they ask to say. And here's part of his message. Paul always gave an opportunity to tell his story. Remember, things are not written down. We've, we've said this many times in, through our Bible studies. Even until you get to the mil, you know the 1500s when you have the Gutenberg press, everything's being passed by word of mouth. Yes, there are things being written down, but there's not widely distrib- wide, dis- wide distribution of those things. So he goes and tells his story again. I am a Jew born in Tarshish, but brought up in this city. He had lived his last years in Jerusalem before he had gone to Damascus. And I studied under the great rabbi that you all know about. And I was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. And I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. They probably got, he got their attention. And I persecuted the followers of the way. Okay, so he's using the old terminology, not Christian, but people of the way. And I persecuted them to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. And as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. So if you doubt what I have to say, just ask them. Then he skips on, he tells a little story. And I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe now, he's, he's changing persons because he's, he's kind of like talking about Jesus. So he's talking about the Christians that he beat. And when the blood of, you, of Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval. So he's telling the story, sometimes in third person, sometimes in first person. And then he goes on, I even obtained letters from the religious council to go to Damascus. And I went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. And then Paul goes on and talks about what happened on the road, how he had the blinding light and and how he was blind for three days and how God spoke to him. Now, it's interesting to me because I don't know how you feel today. If someone came to you and says, God spoke to me, I think most of us would, would be accommodated to that, but it's not something that we hear a lot of people say. We hear people say, God spoke to my heart, you know, we just sense that God was speaking to us, but there's very few people that talk about that God spoke to them audibly. But that's exactly what Paul's saying. But they're not getting upset about that. They they thought, hey, that's all right. We believe God does speak, which is interesting to me as I read this, because I think we get a little, you know, we get a little more out of shape about some of that than these people here. They Thought that was natural, that God would audibly speak to Paul. No problem. But it was his next line that got him in trouble. Then the Lord said to me, go, and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now, Sue's trying to find me here, and I'm skipping all over the place because I'm trying to tell a story here and get here. So sorry about that, Sue. Okay. And at that point, the crowd goes berserk, and they shout, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. So they have no problem with his story until all of a sudden he brings Gentiles into the discussion. Now, as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks, I mean, they are mad. I mean, they're working up a sweat. They're throwing off their outer cloaks, you know, and they're flinging dust in the air. And they're, they're ready really for a riot. The commander ordered that Paul be taken to the barracks. He then directed, bless his heart. He's the one that's getting beaten up. He's now going to get flogged. He's directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him. They wanted to beat out a confession, I guess. And as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, 
is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? So Paul pulls out his Roman citizen card. Here, let me show you here. Let me get out my wallet here. It says right here, Roman citizen. Is this how you treat a Roman citizen? And I imagine they went whiter than white. Now, this is the second time he's pulled out his card. The first one was when him and Silas got beaten, and it was primarily to protect the Christians from the abuse that they probably were going to experience. This is the second time he pulls out the card. And when the centurion heard this, he immediately ran or probably had someone go to the commander and report it. What are you going to do? He asked, this man is a Roman citizen. What have we gotten ourselves into here? The commander was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Hey, that's the least of it. They were getting ready to beat the living daylights out of him. And he wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day, he orders the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Now, again, the Sanhedrin is kind of the religious Supreme Court. Every major city that had a large Jewish population would have a mini version of the of a Sanhedrin. And basically, it was the elders that the people would take their issues, whether they're religious or had conflict with their fellow Jews, and the Sanhedrin would resolve those issues. But in Jerusalem, you had a, a Sanhedrin made up of about 70, primarily Pharise Sadducees and with some Pharisees. So Nicodemus and uh, Joseph of Arimathea, they were both part of the Sanhedrin that were there when Jesus was crucified. Um, so he's calling the, the, the highest level of authority within the religious community to come and resolve this issue because he's got to make sure that he appeases the mob, but because he's a Roman citizen, there's some things he can't do. And so he brings Paul before them, and they start a dialogue. Here's Paul talking to the Sanhedrin. My brothers, interesting term, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. And at this, the high priest Ananias, Ananias and, Ka and Caiaphas, who we know of from the Jesus story, they kind of went back and forth. They were actually related to each other. And sometimes they served to kind of together. Sometimes one would be in the story. So we have the high priest Ananias here. He ordered those standing near to Paul to strike him across the mouth because he felt like he had been disrespectful. My brothers, you're not a brother. I have fulfilled my duty in all good conscience. In other words, what I have done is because I believe it's the right thing to do. And Ananias just says, this is sacrilege. This is ridiculous. And he has Paul slapped. Then Paul says to him, to Ananias, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> now, that doesn't seem very bad, but I mean, that that's like the worst thing you could say, okay? You whitewashed tombs in order to give the appearance that they still look good, okay? And many times, Jesus actually, we referring to the Pharisees, we would call them whitewashed sepulchers. In other words, it's all a facade. What's inside is nothing but death. And so he's kind of using that imagery there. And you sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourselves violate the law by commanding that I be struck, which was forbidden within the law. You didn't, you know, there were only under special circumstances were you allowed to strike somebody without consequences. And Paul says, you just violated the law. You're telling me I violated the law. You just violated the law. Somebody elbows Paul and in the ribs, kind of like, remember when we used to go to church and some of us would fall asleep and then we'd get elbowed by our spouses, right? Well, somebody elbows Paul and says, Paul, Paul, just keep it down. How dare you insult the high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize he was the high priest. Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. He's actually quoting from the Old Testament. Now, 
this supports this little event supports what many people believe that Paul's eyesight was terrible. He could not see who was speaking to him. He probably just saw that there was a mass out there. We know this. We talked about this maybe last week or the week before that Paul, many of his letters, Paul didn't actually write. He dictated them and he always had someone writing. And then he would say at the very end, just to let you know that it's I, Paul, giving this. And he writes and he probably either wrote in big letters or whatever it was, but he didn't have the capacity because of his eyesight. Some people believe there was there was a type of malaria from the region he was from that actually impacted the eyes. It, the, the eyes would drain all the time. It was not it was not something. And even the Galatians who were from that region said, "We would love to give you our eyes because he probably was not someone you wanted to look at. He he was not the poster boy that says, oh, come and hear the great evangelist. And people would look at him and says, you have got to be kidding. There's no way I'm going to see this guy because he probably was not appealing to the eyes. But here's another evidence to support the fact that his eyesight was so bad. He did not recognize. He spoke of what he didn't know. Okay. So let's continue our story. Then Paul, who kind of in his own way apologizes, says, I, I am, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I was disrespectful to you because he quotes from the Old Testament. But he keeps on going. And he throws a bee into the crowd. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees. Remember, I told you the Sanhedrin is made up the Sadducees and Pharisees. They did not like each other. They were always theologically having arguments. Remember Sadducees. They were sad, you see, because of what? They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in miracles. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in the resurrection, believed in miracles. Um, they were much more probably a, a tune, akin to our belief system today. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, were they only believed in the first five books. They didn't like the prophets. They didn't like those things. And so there was constant arguments going on. You know, and so he calls out and he decides he's going to get them really riled up. My brothers, I am a Pharisee. <laughs> All right. So he's now identifying descendants from Pharisees. And I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And the Pharisees are going, yay, yay. And when he said this, a dispute breaks out between the Pharisee and the Sadducees because the Sadducees heresy that's not true and so they're going back and so the focus now moves from paul and so they start arguing with each other and the assembly was divided and then luke goes on to explain the sadducees says there is no resurrection that there are neither angels nor spirits but the pharisees believed in all these things and so paul knows this and he stirs the pot as a instructor sometimes i have the joy of doing this with my students because i know that many times they come from different perspectives and sometimes they will just regurgitate to me what they were told and sometimes i want them to think it through a little deeper and so i will purposely say something that i know will kind of you know, I don't want to destroy their faith or anything, but I'll say something that's kind of a little off. And all of a sudden you can see it. I mean, I got hands shooting up. And then of course, one person in the class will say, Dr. Prashant, you can't really believe that. And someone else in the class, of course he can say that. And then I, I just step back and watch him go at it. And it's kind of fun. Now I got to be careful, you know, cause I, I want to keep teaching. Um, and so we'll come back and we'll say, okay, let's talk this through. And I'll say, why do you feel this way? And they'll explain it. Okay, why do you feel this way? Okay, why do you disagree? And we'll try to find, is there any common ground? Is it based on truth or is it based on this, what somebody told them since they were a little kid? And it's always interesting to see this, those that all of a sudden realize everything I was taught as a kid's not true. And that's pretty disabling for some students when they and it's not everything they were taught but they says that's not what i was taught at all and it wasn't true i'm going to go home i had one student i'm going to go home and i'm going to tell my parents and my sunday school teachers that they told me was wrong and i had to say ah this, 
maybe wisdom should prevail and you might not want to do that. What Paul is, now he's not doing it for educational purposes. He's doing it because I think he's wanting to take the pressure off himself. So there's this great uproar. And some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and they argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man. So he's, so he's, he's basically, here's his actually smart thing. He took the pressure off the Roman commander and he put it on the Sanhedrin. Paul did that for him. By raising this issue, he's now getting them to kind of resolve this. So he's, what if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? We, we think that's, purely, that's acceptable. And the dispute became so violent <laughs> between the Pharisees and the Sadducees that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. So he ordered the troops to go down, take him away from them by force, and they actually then brought him to the barracks. So they protect him for the night. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath to kill Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot, and they went to the chief priests and the elders, the Sanhedrin, and said, we have taken a solemn oath to kill Paul. They were kind of going to do the dirty business for the Sanhedrin. So here's what we want you to do. You and the Sanhedrin petitioned the commander to bring Paul before you one more time, and while they're bringing him from the barracks where they got too many Roman soldiers and they bring him to where you're at, we're going to kill him as he's being moved here. Now, I bet you some of them never saw this before, but when the son of Paul's sister paused there, did you know that Paul had a sister? Some of you are shaking your head, yes. You know how many times I read that and just glossed right over it? You know, because I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the events and everything else, and I miss this. So Paul had a sister, and the son, so that be his nephew, was there in Jerusalem, and he gets wind of a plot. against. He gets wind of this plot. And he goes into the barracks, probably had to get permission, and he gets word, whether he says it to him himself or gets word to Paul about this plot. Then Paul calls the centurions, the soldiers, and says, take this young man, take my nephew to the commander. He has something to tell you. So they took him to the commander, and he tells him about the plot against Paul. Then he, the Roman commander, calls two of his centurions and orders them, get a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. <laughs> One man's being guarded by a group of 270, 470 soldiers. And they're going to take him north to Caesarea. And we're going to see a picture of Caesarea here and get him there by nine o'clock tonight. And they provided horses for Paul because they're not going to make him walk. And they take him safely to Caesarea where he comes in contact with Felix. Now, because I'm running out of time, I want to get to the map. We'll come back here. This is an, in the upper left corner upper left that is a um, artist rendition of what Caesarea on the sea looked like they had a man-made uh, port for the ships to come in because there's no real good port there they had their own amphitheater they had the hippodrome that's that kind of long thing where they would have the uh, chariot races um, it, and of course it was a walled city and in it was this area, and for those who are, I'm in face-to-face -face right here, that's a blow-up there of Herod's palace. And that's where they took Paul to, was to this palace to wait to go and present himself to the Roman officials. This is what it looks like today from the air. So the port is, is there in the upper kind of left you can see where they had built part of it out, but the, the wall, outer wall, has been destroyed over time, and so it's now open to the Mediterranean Sea. You can see right here, kind of in the middle, going north and south, that big open area, that was the, where they had the chariot races, right there. And then it's not in the scene here, but the big amphitheater, which still is being used today. They've remodeled it a little bit, but it was in pretty good shape uh, as a, a fine. And it's, it's off the, 
the picture here, you can't see it kind of south that took place. So this was Caesarea on the coast, sometimes called Caesarea Martitima. And this is where Paul is going to hang out for probably weeks at, at a minimum, because he's going to have meetings with Felix and Festus and later on Agrippa. All of that's going to take place while he's housed here. This is a was built by Herod the Great, so there was nothing there, and he just decided to build a port and a city there. Oh, I do have a picture. This is, you can see at the very bottom, the very edge, that's the hippodrome where they did the chariot races. So you can see it's in close proximity, and they've, they've made it so it's still usable today, but pretty much that's the size of what the amphitheater was. So every major city in the Roman Empire had a hap amphitheater. And so this, this was, is no different. Well, I'm going to close with a song. I'm doing it for two reasons. One, I want to make sure I can actually play songs that record and, and work through. But I was thinking, what song best fits Paul's life? And I thought of through it all. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus I've learned to trust in God. And I'm talking here because I'm waiting for it to come on because right now it's telling me I can't play it. And we may not be able to play it, which is not a good thing. So I'll actually do the lyrics. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know basically what, what's going on, right and wrong, whatever. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials only come to make me strong through it all, through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon his word. And it looks like it's not going to work. And by the way, if this is true, we're going to have to go to plan B for what happens after I finish Paul and Friends. Um, or I got to find out from Tony how to make it work because he gets it work for his, his Zoom meetings. That's how I wanted to end today. Because Paul is now at the end. He's going to get arrested. And he's now beginning his journey that's going to end him up in Rome. And we'll pick up that story next week, what happens there, because the Jews are told to come and they present their case and Paul's going to present his case and they're going to, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And, and then he's going to make his journey over to Rome. And then probably the week after that, we're going to talk about what happened after he's released from prison, which the scripture doesn't tell us about, but history does. And so we're going to look at that. So with that thought, I'm going to stop sharing here and close in a word of prayer. No, not, that's not even working. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Let's pray as we close today. Father, what an incredible person Paul was. Lord, you used him in so many different ways. And there were times he was so bold and he knew what, what needed to be done at any given moment. We thank you for the wisdom you gave him. But we thank you, Lord, more importantly for the lesson that of the lyrics of the song I just read, because that could capture Paul's life. Here he was early on in his life, persecuting Christians, and now he is by far one of the, the most vocal persons supporting you, Jesus, and sharing that good news. He learned so much through all the difficulties of life, and every time it was a new opportunity to, to learn how to trust you Teach us, Lord, so that we can sing the songs through it all, through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said amen. God bless you all. Have a great, great day, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.